So I'm Emma Plant and today I'm going to talk about my research as a PhD student on the Gallant Project, which investigates gardens as pollinator habitat. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit about how I've used the entomology collection at the Hunterian to help with my research. Um, so firstly, I thought I'd just give a bit of background about what Gallant actually is. So it stands for Glasgow as a Living Laboratory, Accelerating Novel Transformation. Um, and it's a partnership between the University of Glasgow and Glasgow City Council um, with the main aim to find solutions for a climate resilient city. Um, and so it works across five different working packages, which address all kinds of problems from flood risk and um, active travel, sustainable energy, vacant and derelict land, and then biodiversity loss. So my research sits in the biodiversity working package, and, and I'm specifically looking at how uh, private green spaces, such as gardens, can be used to increase pollinator diversity. And um, so pollinators, they provide an important ecosystem service in that they pollinate 85% of flowering plants around the world, but they are in severe decline um, due to stresses, including land use change. So the process of urbanization and uh, building cities, that is a land use change and evidence generally points to fewer pollinators um, in urban areas when we compare them to natural areas. Um, and this really is due to the environmental pressures in cities, such as a lack of floral resources, or even if there's a lot of um, floral resources around, they tend to be exotic, non-native plant species. Um, so essentially these environmental pressures, they act like sieves where they filter out some of the pollinator species from the urban environment based on the traits that these pollinators have. Um, so for example, in cities we find more generalist pollinators. These are pollinators that are able to pollinate a wide range of plants. And um, in comparison to, um, we sort of lose more of the specialist pollinator species, which um, are very specific about what they like to pollinate and where they get their floral resources from. Um, and then on top of this, we still lack knowledge of how different land use within a city can influence pollinators. Um, so particularly in these private green spaces where it's hard to get access to um, and where gardeners often favor sort of exotic non-native plant species. Um, and it's really important to understand this because gardens in particular can like collectively contribute to a large proportion of habitat in a city. So in Glasgow, there's 3,000 hectares of gardens compared to 700 hectares of parks. So the main aims of my uh, project were to assess how diverse um, gardens are, uh, how diverse pollinators are in gardens, um, and also to assess what is actually influencing pollinator diversity in gardens, um, and as well to um, determine whether pollinators have a preference for the non-native or native plant species. Um, so to do this, I uh, recruited 18 gardens across Glasgow via social media, um, and I visited them once a month from June until September last year. And I measured the garden characteristics such as the size of the garden and um, floral abundance. So that is the number of plants or the and the floral richness, which is the number of plant species. Um, and then I observed one plant 
of each of these uh, floral species for 20 minutes um, and recorded the bee, hoverfly, um, or butterflies that interacted with these plants. Um, and there is other pollinators such as beetles, wasps, but I chose um, these three um, groups because they are cited to be the most effective pollinators. Um, so any species that um, could be identified in the field, um, I would do so, but others I would have to collect and take to the lab to identify. Um, so generally, things like bumblebees, uh, the honeybee and butterfly, I could identify them in the field, whereas um, solitary bees and hoverflies would be collected to be identified under the microscope. Um, so this brings me to the Hunterian collection. Um, so the entomological collection at the Hunterian contains si around 600,000 specimens. Um, and these date from the 18th century um, with a large proportion originating from Scotland, um, but they also have uh, species from around the world. Um, and new material for this collection is often gathered through university research, such as mine, or through um, local biological recording. Um, so what actually is the purpose of these collections? Um, essentially, they are like libraries, which can um, house new species to science. Um, so they act as a reference for further study if people um, find more of the species. Um, and they also um, allow us to measure species change. So um, these specimens are often labeled with um, important ecological information, such as when and where they were found. Um, so we can tell if um, distributions of species have changed over time. Um, they also help engage um, the public because uh, it generates interest in biodiversity. Um, and finally, the reason that I use them was to help um, with species identification. Um, so many insects have uh, very minute differences between um, species, which requires a microscope to be able to tell them apart. We also use um, what we call dichosomous keys um, to help us identify species. Um, and this is where we select between two characteristics, um, which then take us to another set of characteristics and by process of elimination, uh, we get to the species uh, that we're looking at. So um, let me just get the pointer. Actually, this is um, an example of a very simple dichotomous key where you will pick between um, the first two characteristics and then it will tell you which direction to go to until you get to um, the species that you're looking at. Now, when we're looking at um, very similar species, um, these keys can be quite difficult to use. Um, and also when you're sort of new to looking and identifying species, they can be quite subjective. Um, so these uh, two species here, they look very similar um, when we're just looking at them uh, at first glance, but the uh, characteristics which define them is that one is uh, more gray bloomed than the other. So to be able to tell if your specimen is gray bloomed, which just means it's slightly grayish looking, um, you want the two spec these two specimens in front of you, as well as your own, to be able to match up which one the species actually is. Um, so it can be quite difficult um, to get used to using these keys and identifying species. So that's why having these 
um, sort of reference specimens in front of you is really invaluable um, when you're doing this. Um, so what did I actually find? I found a total of um, 58 pollinator species across all the gardens, um, which does suggest that um, gardens provide good habitat for pollinators. Um, now, the most common species that I found were the common carder bumblebee, um, the buff and white-tailed bumblebees, the marmalade hoverfly, uh, this hoverfly, Platycyrus albumanus, um, and also the honeybee. Um, and this isn't really that surprising because they're generalist species. Um, they pollinate a wide range of plants and they're really high in abundance. Um, and the most common plants that I recorded were lavender and geranium. Um, so I also found... Um, two new hoverflies for Glasgow. So um, these were Melagramma guttatum and Sp Spangina verecunda. Um, I'm not so good at the Latin names yet, um, but these species are likely under-recorded, um, firstly because there's not that many people out there looking for them. Um, and secondly, because they look quite similar to other species. Um, so again, this highlights the need for collecting specimens. Um, and I'd also like to note that all of the species that I have found, um, all that data will be fed into the Biological Record Center um, based at Glasgow Museums. And this is basically just um, a big species list for Glasgow. Um, and now in terms of pollinator preferences um, between native and non-native plant species, there was actually a higher number of pollinator species um, that interacted with native plants compared to non-native plants. However, this difference wasn't quite significant. Um, but when I looked at the number of interactions, um, there were significantly higher number of interactions with non-native plants than native plants. So the opposite to this. Um, and this is different from what I was expecting, but I do suspect it's likely because a large proportion of the interactions were from these generalist pollinators that I mentioned before. And um, so, for example, the common carder bumblebee accounted for 25% of all the um, interactions that I found. Um, however, when we um, look at this graph here, so actually, if we increase the number of species of um, non-native plants, we actually got fewer interactions. Um, so what I think this means is that, um, yes, while some non-native plants were um, interacted with a lot, um, they, the when we actually added more um, non-native plant species, these were redundant and actually weren't interacted with. Um, however, when we look at the native plant species, when we added more native plants, um, we actually got an increase in the number of interactions. So therefore, not only were we getting more interactions as we had more um, native plant species, we also had potentially more uh, pollinator species as well. Um, so I will also just say that these results are still quite preliminary um, and I have quite a lot of work to do analyzing whether other aspects of the garden, such as the size um, and how people are managing these gardens are influencing pollinators. And um, so this is just the first stage of the analysis. Um, so in conclusion, um, I 
uh, found that the evidence points towards gardens providing good habitat for pollinators um, with potentially um, with gardens with native plants supporting more pollinators than gardens with non-native plants. Um, so this year I'm repeating my study again. Um, however, I am surveying um, in April and May um, or have surveyed in April and May, um, which may sort of influence these results between native and non-native plants um, because native plant um, flowering season peaks earlier than non-native plants. Um, so there's evidence that suggests that um, pollinators re rely more on native plants at the start of the season. Um, and then finally, I'm also conducting my study in allotments um, and comparing them to gardens. So allotments are thought to be really valuable green spaces for pollinators. Um, and I have already started um, this uh, field work. And so far, I found one new bee species for Glasgow, um, which is the hairy footed flower bee. Um, and hopefully it's a sign of more exciting finds to come. Um, and I will continue to be using the Hunterian collection to help me identify these species. Um, so thank you for listening. Uh, thanks to my supervisors, Dominic McCafferty, Davide Dominoni, Rhea Dunkley, um, and thanks to Jan Robinson from the Hunterian and to all the garden owners for supplying their gardens for me. <laughs>